Well, it's lovely to be with you again. Thank you for your very warm welcome. It's, uh, I don't usually go to the same place speaking too often. It's only, it's just a month since I was last here, but it's good to be here again. And I said last month that uh, you'd take me back 30 years. In a good way, because uh, it's a while, a long while, since I was in a community of the Lord's people who in such a way openly prayed the way that uh, this little gathering of the Lord's people uh, are able to do. And that really lifted my heart. I also said, you've taken me 30 years because of this thing here. <laughs> so yesterday I took myself back 30 years and I got oh, some slides out and some pens and I thought, I'll have a go because I've not used one of these. But all this time, yeah. So here we are. Yeah, well, seeing it's only just a month since I was last here, you will, of course, remember what I talked about. The, <laughs> the uh, suffering servant in Isaiah. But if you took nothing else away, I hope you took that away, an encouragement to read the Old Testament and to be ready to see the Lord Jesus in it. Because this Bible, it might, you might think it's got many purposes, but cover to cover, the whole purpose of this Bible is to bring you close to the Lord Jesus and to find salvation through his blood. And uh, you know, when I first started reading it, in fact, I'll tell you a little bit about it myself. I went to Sunday school. Uh, I was sent, and yet I didn't mind being sent. I quite enjoyed it, actually. You know, you get these people, oh, I was sent to Sunday school. <laughs> uh, well, I quite enjoyed it, but uh, I never won any prizes because I wasn't that regular. Uh, and by about the age of 14, certainly 15, uh, I'd stop going, largely because my family were not church-going people at all. But my mother, in her wisdom, said, I think you ought to go to Sunday school so that when the time comes, at least you know what to choose. A wise woman. And she had, uh, you know, some bits of scripture, like when we were kids and we mourned and having to do a job. Them that will not work, neither shall they eat. She was rather good at quoting scriptures to us in that sort of way, my mother. So in her wisdom, uh, on the times when we weren't doing anything else, I was a family, not of churchgoers, but of cyclists. Now, it's not that cycling and belonging to a cycling club and being a Christian and being a worshipping member of a church, it's not that they're absolute opposites and wrong. It's just that cycling clubs cycle on a Sunday. So in my family, there was no history of church going. They were cyclists. So although I had this uh, history in my own life of going to Sunday school because I was sent, yet by the time I was 15, I was with the cycling club, dare I say, religiously every Sunday. And uh, I regarded myself as an agnostic. I read, uh, we've forgotten his name now, the famous philosopher of the 1950s, the atheist, whenever, whenever the BBC wanted some, an atheist on the radio, they, they wheeled him out. Bertrand Russell is the name. Uh, he wrote a book saying why I am not a Christian. So I avidly read this and I thought, what a load of rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> he is the most famous philosopher of his time. He's a brilliant mathematician. And that's the best he can do. He'd almost made me want to be a Christian again. But not quite. So I went up to college uh, as an atheist. A little group of us quite quickly got together. There were about eight in our core group. But it sometimes swelled up to a perhaps a dozen, and uh, we always met after the evening meal. We, we were people who lived in college, and uh, after the evening meal, 
we met in somebody's room for coffee. Um, we took it in turns. At one particular evening, for some reason I can't remember, I had something to do and I went to my own room to just do something before I joined the other people for coffee. And when I went in, I found that uh, there was quite a lively discussion going on. And it was one guy who went to church and the other five or six people asking him all sorts of different, difficult questions. They weren't really attacking him in any nasty sort of way, let's not think that. But they were asking him about all this and, you know, really, really saying, well, why, why do you bother? And he was having a bit of a hard time. Now, it's really strange because I went into that room and the discussion's already going on. And I answered every single one of their questions. It's as if the answer came from up there into my head. All right, partly it would have been the, the very good training I got from my erratic Sunday school attendance because the Sunday school really was good at that time. Uh, but somehow the answers just appeared in my noddle. And quite quickly, this uh, discussion came to a quite amicable uh, termination. And the guy that had been the subject of these questions, as we were all splitting up to go back to our own room to do some work, because in those days, students did do work. Have I said something? <laughs> as I was leaving, he said, do you want to come to College Chapel with me on Sunday? And my head is saying, I've escaped from that. I've got rid of that. I don't really want to get involved with that again. And my head was saying no. And out of my mouth came yes. So I had to really, didn't I? Because I said I'd go, so I joined him. And College Chapel, well, because we were students of the college, we sat more or less in the choir stalls. He knew what to do. We came in at the door and picked a white surplus up and put it over the top of whatever we were wearing and sat there. And yet when I got in there, I hesitate to say I heard the very voice of God. I think that's going much too far. And yet it was almost as if I heard a voice saying, welcome back, David. Nice to see you where you should be. And the rest, as they say, Thank you. And really, that's why I'm here this morning. Just to share with you that uh, even though you drift away sometimes, and I'm praying at this moment for my grandsons, uh, even though you might drift away, that seed could well have been planted and the Holy Spirit will work on that seed. And at some point, wow, you just do not know. So, thank you for letting me share that little testimony. But that's really how I've ended up here. So, last time I was here, I talked about uh, the suffering servant. And I encourage you to read the Old Testament, keeping your eyes open for hints of Jesus. Uh, but, not just now. Because I'm going to read Psalm 2. And I want you to cast out of your mind any possible thoughts of New Testament theology. I want you to cast away any thoughts of Jesus because I'm afraid those get in the way of our understanding what the original psalm meant. I want to concentrate on what this psalm meant to its original writer and its original hearers three and a half thousand years ago. So if you want to turn with me to Psalm 2, and although in my normal study I use the NIV as it happens, I quite frequently turn back to King James Version, and that's what I'm going to read this morning, uh, which I suspect is what most of you have. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> A real Bible, in other words. <laughs> So, Psalm 2. Hey, I wonder, should we read it together? I'll tell you what. I'm going to ask you to read verse 1, and I will go in with verse 2, and we'll read alternately. So, are you ready? I'll start now. 
Why? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying... He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. And I forgot to say, when you get towards the end, you'll find the word son. In your mind, will you please cross that capital S out and put a little S, so that you're not tempted to think beyond what I want you to think. So, that is Psalm 2. And uh, this newly appointed king, and I'm sorry we have no idea whatsoever which king this might have been. It could have been King David. It certainly wouldn't have been Solomon because he was crowned in rather a rush if you read uh, the history of that. It could well have been King Solomon's son. Oh, well, we don't know. Let's, so let's get on from there. But this newly appointed king is the Lord's anointed. The word anointed, of course, literally means with oil poured on their head. And it's the word from which the word Messiah comes. At this time, uh, that word did not have a particular meaning of that extra special person the Messiah as we understand it now, that person sent by God, it only meant being recognised as, appointed as, and literally oil poured on, anointed as this certain person. So we're reading a... Uh, 30 years out of practice. We're reading a psalm for the king, who at this point is the anointed one. And only later did that word Messiah take on its very special meaning that the Jews uh, understood. One day God will send a special ruler. One day God will send somebody very specially appointed by him to bring the Jews back into the greatness that they uh, should have under God. So for now, don't think of Jesus, just think of this all too human king who's been marked out by the anointing, by the uh, oil poured on his head. So the installation of a king was a big deal really. We've only just had the coronation of King uh, King Charles, haven't we? I keep wanting to call him King George. King Charles III. And we saw all the pomp and circumstance of that coronation. And aren't the British good at that sort of thing? Nobody else does it like us. Uh, and yet I suspect that when this king was crowned, there wasn't that sort of pomp and circumstance at all. Uh, and yet the main thing still essential to our own coronation service, the main thing was the anointing by the pouring on his head of that oil that showed that 
it was God who had chosen him and it was God's Holy Spirit who would lead him. So the uh, coronation of a king, quite a big deal. So also we say about this anointed, every single king and every single priest was anointed with oil. So I'm able to say that uh, there were many messiahs, hundreds if not thousands of messiahs. Did you realise that? Because hundreds if not thousands of people had oil poured on their head when they were appointed as king or priest. And yet, I've written Messiahs with little m. There is only one Messiah with a capital M. Only one is the real chosen one of God who came as our Saviour. That, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Psalm 2, it says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? My kids, when I used to teach Sunday school, I could draw a sort of letter J on the, bo on the board and they'd all know immediately what it was. And just in case you think that my pen slipped or my hand slipped, that little blob there is Mount Carmel, where Elijah had his, shall we say, competition with the prophets of Baal. There's the Sea of Galilee, there's the Dead Sea, there's Jerusalem. I always want it to be nearer the middle, but it's quite a long way down there. And under David, it became the capital of that land. Who are the nations? Well, here they are. The nations are particularly Aram, Ammon, Moab and Edom. They were the people who were always looking out for a weakness on Israel. They surrounded uh, Israel. Egypt was there as well, but Egypt was more of a world power and to an extent kept itself to itself. The Philistines, of course, were a pain in the neck all the time. Uh, but hey, how much like today is that? There are the people of God, and I say the people of God for the present Israel, I honestly don't know quite how much in a spiritual sense they are still, there are certainly some very orthodox Jews in that land, but there are many who are really there just politically. Yeah. And I, I never know quite wh whether to talk of them as the people of God or not. So forgive me if you have a slightly different uh, attitude or opinion to them, sorry. So, surrounded by enemies, even like today, because they've got Gaza down here, just where the Philistines were, and just further, further off the map, they've got Iran, because it's Iran who are causing the trouble with Hezbollah and with Hamas, the people of God. I'm using that phrase, as I say. The people of God are surrounded today by their enemies. And the reason why it's so difficult to find peace in that land is because Hamas, Hezbollah and the whole country of Iran have one purpose, and that is to totally obliterate and destroy Israel out of that land. So, Israel is threatened now. But it was in those days as well. Usually, Israel was the boss. It kept them in the place. And yet, every now and again, they, they would have a bit of a rebellion. And sometimes they'd join together. Edom and Moab, in particular, would conspire together as to how they might overcome the land of, of uh, Israel. Let's cast off their shackles. Let's get rid of their rule and be our own people. The nations, of course, you may or may not know. Edom came from Esau, 
who was the brother of Jacob, and uh, Ammon and Moab were descended from the sons of Lot, who of course was the nephew of Abraham. So all these people, Israel itself, plus Edom, plus Moab, plus Ammon, and not quite the same with Aram, but all those people were related. They were cousins. And yet they were, they were always at each other's throats. So imagine the time when Jerusalem not only ruled uh, Israel itself, but ruled the other nations as well. Imagine that time, and yet the other nations are saying, yeah, let's, let's rebel, let's cast off their shackles. And yet, what do we find in verse 2? The kings of the earth set themselves together, the rulers take counsel against the Lord and against the Lord's anointed. These people are fighting against God's king and they're fighting against God himself. And the result is, in verse 4, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. Did you know God laughed? You don't need any jokes. <laughs> but God laughs because to him, the uh, plotting and the rebellions and all the upsets of the various people of this earth, he knows how useless they are. I've, I've, I suppose some of you use Facebook, all of you, many of you use Facebook. No? Well, 12 years ago, it was a way to keep your eye on what the kids were doing. But, uh, <laughs> the kids do other things now, so I don't know what they're doing. But people keep putting little videos. And what's been, uh, keep coming up just recently, is a big dog, like a, a I forgot what it's called. Things they have in black and, and go, never mind, a big dog. And a little tiny kitten coming up and annoying it and cuddling up and keeping warm in it and biting its ears and... Oh, and you know very well that that dog could just go... Or it could, you know, one bite and that's breakfast of the kitten. And it just puts up with it because it knows it's no real harm. And when it's fed up, it'll sort things out. God laughs! at all the shenanigans that the people of this world get up to. Because in God's good time, he will make everything right. So, let's throw off their fetters, they say, but they're wasting the time. And God laughs at their puny efforts. And then God speaks to them in his anger or his wrath. And he says, look, I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Just put the emphasis in there. It's God who has set this king up in this country for this purpose. So the people around should know right from the beginning that they're wasting the time. And then let's go a little bit further on into the uh, coronation ceremony itself. Something quite interesting here. In verse 9, it, oh sorry, let's just look at verse 8 for a minute. He's talking to the king and he says, ask of me and I will give you the heathen for your inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. That's a quite extravagant language, isn't it? Because as far as the king of Jerusalem is concerned, he's really talking about what you can see on this map. You will be the people in charge. You will be the greatest. The Mount of Zion will be the peak in this land. So it's a fairly extravagant language in a way, 
But God is saying, look, you're my king, and I will see that this is what will happen to you. Verse 9, he says, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, it's actually known from other sources outside the Bible that when kings or pharaohs, I perhaps should say, in Egypt were appointed or set up to rule, uh, ceramic well, toby jugs, I suppose almost, were prepared in as effigies of all the nations that they were going to conquer or that they were going to keep under control. And at a certain point during the service of the uh, coronation, the king, or the just newly appointed king, would take his iron rod, his scepter really, we, our king has a, has a gold one, it's too heavy, you can't imagine him even clubbing anybody with it, it's too heavy, but an iron rod which marks the strength of the kingship and of the rule, the king was supposed to take this iron rod and sweep all those ceramic whatever pots off this table and if they all if he got them all in one go and they all smashed on the floor that was a good sign because that is what he would do to these rebellious nations all around him so that was part became part of the coronation service for this king the king of the jews or the king of israel and let's just read quickly through the remaining verses because he's telling if this is what our king is going to do he's going to sweep you all aside like this pottery vases knocked off the table be wise now therefore all you kings all the rest of you be instructed ye judges of the earth serve the lord with fear and rejoice with trembling Kiss the son lest he be angry. And this bit, those few words, can get us into a bit of trouble if we're only thinking about Jesus as the son and the king. We can be a little bit worried as to just what is meant and intended if we have to kiss the son uh, unless he gets angry with us. But in the context here, it's very clear. Because again, from sources outside the Bible, it becomes uh, known that the Assyrian emperors, if any of their vassal kings came to give homage to them, do you know what they'd have to do? They would have to crawl across the floor to his throne and then they would kiss his feet. And some of them different translations from the King James have taken that word kiss and said look it, uh, it, it has slightly deeper meaning than what we understand it as and in the newer, some of the newer translations it actually says kiss his feet and it's a, it's a good translation that because it reflects what is known to have happened uh, certainly in Assyria this vassal king who'd come to ask favours of the emperor crawled across the floor and kissed his feet. That's the amount of honour you had better show this king. Because look, if he gets angry, you really are in trouble. But the very last half dozen words, but blessed are they that put their trust in him. And again, that was a purely political statement in the context of this psalm when it was written and originally read. It was, if you put your trust in our king, he'll look after all of your lands. And that is certainly what uh, the Assyrian emperors tried to put forward. So be warned you lot, Serve God and pay homage to our king because, oh, did I miss that out? My goodness, that's why, that's what happens when you talk without looking at your notes, isn't it? Verse 7, 
I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, in other words to this king, Thou art my son. This day I have begotten thee. So at that time, at the very time of his coronation, that king was regarded as the very son of God. And again, we know from, uh, from outside the Bible that many other emperors and kings regarded themselves or were proclaimed to be the son of God. You're probably very well aware that the Roman emperors, in slightly later times, many of the Roman emperors were worshipped as gods. And even in the Bible, if we look a little further on, we find uh, that uh, King Solomon's son is... Uh, King, oh dear. King Solomon's son is stated to be, at his own coronation, is stated to be the very son of God. So that was a quite well-known thing to happen. But whenever you read the Old Testament, read it expecting to find Jesus. So what I shackled you with earlier on don't even think about Jesus. Throw those shackles away now. Because that son, the only true son of God, is the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sure I meant to put this uh, slide on much later, but let's put it on now. Jesus, the Christ, the only true, actual, authentic son of God. All the others were just claimed to be sons of God at the time when they had this oil poured on their heads. But let's be absolutely sure that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And the Jews, in fact, Jews themselves, did regard this psalm as messianic. We look at the New Testament and we find that when Jesus was taken into the temple at uh, 30, days, 30 days old, taken to Jerusalem, into the temple. We find uh, Simeon, that very old man, who'd been promised by God that he wouldn't die until after he had seen the promise of God, the very Messiah. When we find Jesus in Samaria talking to that woman at the well, uh, she keeps changing the subject and uh, Jesus keeps guiding her back to where he wants her to be and she changes the subject again and then Jesus puts a point to her oh and she gives up she says when the Messiah comes he'll tell us all these things so even the Samaritans knew about the Messiah the Christ Christ of course I'm teaching my grandma to suck eggs here, aren't I? Uh, Christ is Greek, meaning anointed. Yeah? Cheers, always. So it's the same word as Messiah. And I sometimes think that uh, where we use the word Christ, we ought to go back occasionally and use the word Messiah. However, so even the Samaritans were expecting the Messiah. So they really had, in Jesus' time, they really did have the expectation of this person that God had promised. So, what does this psalm say to us now? First of all, when we think of how great God is, isn't it surprising that people are rebelling against him all the time. Yeah? What have we done wrong that somehow in our own lives and uh, testimonies we've not managed to get this message out about the greatness of God? But, uh, and I, I, I'm, I've been a scientist, my title used to be something with science in the middle of it. So 
come on, I believe in science. But uh, to an extent, it's science giving people excuses. We don't need to believe in God, do we? Because science has explained it all for us. Hey, have you noticed since they started viewing things with this James Webb Space Telescope, the JWST, every week somebody comes up and says, oh, we didn't, <laughs> look at him there. <laughs> we didn't expect to find that. That doesn't fit in with our theories at all. We're going to, and even in the realm of uh, evolution, something else is, we'll have to rewrite the whole of evolution to fit that in. And don't, don't argue against science, you'll be on a, you'll lose the battle nearly every time. But isn't it funny, in these fairly recent days, how more and more, it's not that science is all wrong, but what is wrong is anybody that says, Science has explained it all, so we don't need God. Because more and more we're finding, oh, science is scratching its head. So where was I? I've gone off my script again. When we think how great God is, isn't it amazing that people rebel against him? Even in the Old Testament, in the Garden of Eden, the eating of that fruit was Adam and Eve's rebellion against God. It'll make you like gods. It was the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can decide what's good and what's bad. You can make your own rules. You'll be just like God. And that's been the story of the world ever since. A rebellion against God. And in later times, about the, the, the building of the Tower of Babel, what were they doing? We will build a building that will reach all the way up to heaven. That's what it says in Genesis. Because they were challenging God and saying, we'll do it our way. In the Old Testament, we have idols and false gods. I've already mentioned, oh, it's gone now. I've already mentioned up there, Mount Carmel, where uh, the 450 prophets of Baal were in competition against uh, the true God of Israel. And uh, in our own times, we have had the so-called enlightenment, which was anything but. We have had communism, which still exists to an extent in China, in Russia, and in the extremely communistic North Korea. We have an increasingly militant Islam, we have humanism, atheism, and sheer apathy, all of which rebel against the church and all it stands for, and therefore are in rebellion against God himself. And we have modern morality, again, which is anything but throwing off the shackles of religion and tradition. And what is God doing? Laughing at it all, just like that big dog when the little kitten is plaguing it. It doesn't matter because God's kingdom on earth continues to grow despite them all. And remember the actions of the people against Jesus himself. The Pharisees' antagonism, the people's cry of crucify him. Huh. And actually, they were the means of fulfilling scripture. They were the means by which Jesus finally ended up on that cross to become our saviour. And then, when the Jewish rulers and the Romans began to persecute Christians in Jerusalem, what happened? Well, a lot of them ran away. And in Acts 8, you'll find when they ran away to places, they kept on talking about Jesus. And so planted, have you ever tried to get rid of dandelions? <laughs> Every time you accidentally leave a little bit of root there, and, but they grow a new dandelion, don't they? 
the very persecution of the church led to its growth. Never forget, our king is not a king of earthly splendour. He didn't come on a white horse, he came on a donkey. He didn't lead his followers on an attack in the Roman garrison, but he went to the temple and demanded holiness. He didn't ascend a throne, he was lifted up on a cross. And in this country, the church has been dismissed as irrelevant, weak and ineffective, impotent against the sin and immorality of our own age. Let's cast off their shackles, they say. We'll make the rules now. And yet, we remain, and it's by God's good grace that we remain, we remain here as an annoyance to the millionth militant atheists and irritant to the conscious the conscience of the don't knows and the don't cares and as a shop window to display the blessings enjoyed by those who take their refuge in him when we looked at verse 8 and it said oh you'll have power to the ends of the earth I said that's rather extravagant just for the king of the Jews but for our king for the Lord Jesus Christ it's not at all extravagant his power extends to the very ends of the earth <coughs> that describes exactly the rule of Jesus at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and we praise God that we have been allowed to bow in grateful worship for our salvation may we you and i continue to be that shop window that displays god's love through jesus and may there be those people who look in at that shop window and be attracted to him amen may god bless you